Okay. So the first thing I wanted to look at is just background and core principles of CBPR, just to set a basis for work. Okay. Uh, participate to action, third park, CBPR, all of these are very wide terms encompassing many different ideas. And there are multiple terminologies have been given to all of the approaches. The aim of this lecture is to give some background to the methodology, to look a little look a bit at why PAR and issues of power are so important in health and to focus on some interesting ideas, methods, and contributions of participatory action research to other research approaches. So it's really the broad outline, and then from there we'll start going more, more deeply into some of the areas. Participatory action research, also called action research, community-based participatory research, feminist participatory research, mutual inquiry, and multiple other titles. And it is an area where a lot of people have tried to claim some kind of ownership over. So you will see multiple titles and you'll see, I think, yeah, they, and there are also different traditions that we'll see later. And there's a lot, there's still contestation in this area as to what constitute, to what yeah, CBPR, CBPR is. They're all, while well, they're not all the same, they all express similar understandings. And for me, the three, the one thing that all have in common is the three overlapping components, is that part of it is participation and education. So it involves participation of community level, involves education. It is research, and it is action. So all three really form core elements of CBPR. The kind of definition to start off with is a, a systematic investigation with collaboration of those infect, affected by the issue being studied for the purpose of action, education and action or affecting change. So you're really starting to see that this is, a, this is about changing systems. It is not just about finding out information. And it's about changing the people that are part of that system. So it's not just collecting the information for publication. It's actually through the research, through the activities, you are meant to change the people and change the context. I, will, I think it's somewhere in this lecture, I will come back to it. There is a strong political element. And I think it's mainly in the next lecture, but we'll talk about it as we go along. Well, participatory, character, participatory. <clears throat> it's cooperative engaging researchers and the communities in a joint process. So it's like you don't go in as a researcher with a fixed idea of what you want to do. You go in and you work with the community members. To, now, if you do the full participatory process, it's involved in all phases, but you'll look a little bit at the ladder of community of participation work. In a little bit later, but it's yeah. You know, as I try to restructure this lecture so that we all are part of it, this is what you would do in the community setting. There's a co-learning process, a system development, and community capacity building. So the other side of it is when you talk about education, it's always that assumption that we will go out and educate the community. But core to participatory work is the community educates us. Uh, I think that education happens on two levels. It's education about what is going on in the community so that we can become more effective. But also, we, if you're really open and working properly, you're learning about yourself and learning, developing your skills the entire time. I talk within the qualitative methods course about your work as a, part, as a qualitative researcher is a lifelong learning process. I think the same thing applies within the participatory, within the CBPR researcher, is that you do learn a certain set of skills, but the one thing that I've picked up and gained, every time I talk to a new 
CBPR person or see a new book, I see a new methodology. And um, one of the texts, again, that I will give to you this afternoon, uh, was at something from the La La uh, Health Systems Conference. It's a textbook that you can download for free from the internet. And they had a whole lot of methods that I'd never heard of before. And there are different approaches. And it's a, it's a place where creativity is instinctive. And you have to work creatively. You have to think on your feet constantly. It's an empowering process, giving community, giving participants control. The whole point of this, of this process is to give up control. It's something that's very, very hard for particularly health, health uh, professionals to do, where everything is about controlling and providing and being God, particularly for the doctors. <laughs> and there's a balance between research and action. So if you're just going and collecting data, you're not doing CBPR. Okay, then CBPR for health. It's, it's pretty much similar, but there's obviously you're moving into more of a health focus. So it's a collaborative process that equitably involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strength that each brings. CBPR begins with a, to a research topic of importance to the community with the aim of combining knowledge and action for social change to improve community health and eliminate health disparities. Okay. So all that you, what they say in here is that the difference within health is you, you, you create a specific focus. But the one thing that's become clear within m most health research and one of the major defining factors of health problems is income disparity. It doesn't matter if a community is actually quite wealthy compared to the two communities that are at the bottom end of health. The one might be wealthier than the other, but if there's a greater health disparity in group A, even if wealthy in group B, often the health conditions in group A will be worse. And that's one of the epidemiological um, confusion that has come out in the literature. The other thing that other major impact on on health has been noted universally and the single thing that impacts almost everywhere is education. And education is about knowledge and about power. So the, it's crucial to understand, so crucial to health is, are these disparities. So CBPR is ideally placed to start to challenge some of these core issues around the impact <coughs> on health. Okay, what is distinctive about this approach, and when you're looking at CBPR, it's not the methods, but the methodological context of application. So a lot, of, you know, some of the methods that have been developed are new, and are things that aren't approaches that aren't usually tried. In um, in other research in other research techniques, but you can do a randomized control trial as part of CBPR, and it be CBPR. But it's the approach that one takes in doing that that makes the difference. So you can do experimental studies. A lot of it does tend to more towards a more qualitative approach and a more understanding approach because. That's where a lot of community people are more comfortable. But you can, but it's, the methodologies don't define it. It is how you do it and how you work with the community that actually defines CBPR. And it's the attitude of the researcher, determine how, by and for whom the research is conceptualized and conducted. So it's about the location of power. And the research is giving up power and handing over power to community members. It starts to make the difference. The other core notion is around how we construct the communities. So we move from a deficit mentality 
where communities are dens of pathogens, ignorance, and risk. They need to be saved. And you see this regularly in the, in the literature and in processes. At risk groups, groups that, why do people not change their behavior? Why are these, how do we change this group's behavior? All of these, I use that little language myself in a lot of studies. So, and I've seen communities as disempowered, seen communities as victims. To move towards an epidemiology of strength, where we don't, we acknowledge some of the threats to community, but we, we also start to look at the assets and opportunities for growth. And where we can work together with these communities to start to develop something new. So if you go into, say, a community like Delft, which I know very well, and you start to see, look at, well, okay, the problem is uh, methamphetamine use is manifest. There's rising levels of tick use, rising levels of HIV. There's huge problem of alcohol. That's the one side of it. On the other side, and this is common with all real, all communities really in South Africa, and something I noticed, uh, yeah, there's the uh, NGOs, there's a, there's a groupings of people that are really committed to change, and they work on a daily basis around that. One of the things I noticed with uh, when we did the OVC study, Orphan and Vulnerable Children's study, we started off that work with which, you know, we went into, I remember particularly going into town of Belcom the one day. And we set up a large workshop of groupings that were providing assistance to orphan and vulnerable children. Because the whole point was to try and build these organizations. And I came in naively expecting like three or four organizations. We could hardly get into the hall. And it was, and what struck me was the hall, one, the hall was full, or a lot of people there. Two, 90 to 95 percent of the people there were women. Very few had much money or any resources themselves. And this very much the defining population of assistance is very often women. Uh, but the positions of power remain men. That's another issue we have to deal with. And the feminist analysis and contribution to CBPR does start to look at that. And yeah, we went to visit some of these projects. And I remember sitting in a small house with a group of women. And they're coming, you know, they, I spoke about, you know, they'd see these kids walking to school or walking the streets barefoot in tattered clothes. And they thought, no, we've got to be able to do something. So they got a donation of some material, and they found a sewing machine, and they started making tracksuits. And they literally would go, if a kid was walking past, they'd pull him off the street and put him in a tracksuit. And now shoes are another matter. They couldn't organize the shoes. And then, but then they had to, they realized that this, you know, they, they were able to get some donations, but not enough. So they managed to get hold of the stove, and then they got some donations of flour, etc., and started making cakes and cooking, and selling that to get money to buy more material. And gradually, and then the woman, she pulled in some of her friends, she pulled in a few more, and we gradually got up to, hello? This is the CBPR, are you looking for? Hmm? Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're just recording the lecture, so okay. Okay, so um, 
Yeah. So, and that story was replicated at multiple levels. And it gave, gave I think, a, a couple of interesting processes that happened there. And I didn't really have the skills, all the resources. And uh, given I was based in Cape Town, and these all happened in Belcom, and it wasn't really, it wasn't really the funding to either live there or to have people permanently stationed in, in, in all of these places. But yeah, there's, uh, and it's, we, we started to try and give some limited assistance to all of these groupings. The other thing that came out from that was just a good way of assessing what the major problems are in, the, in every community. And if one looked at the nature of the groupings that were collected there, it was around orphan and vulnerable children and around domestic and sexual violence. Everything was the community centered around that, the organizations. And that get, gives, gave me some indication as to what, so if you want to start getting some sense of where uh, problems are in a community, look at where people are organizing to provide assistance. And it is a, a powerful South African thing, and I'm not sure if it applies in other countries. It probably does. But it is a very powerful African tradition that when communities start to break down, people in that community do start to gather. And the Tanzanian model around HIV, and, and I should remember the name of it, I'll come back to me, uh, developed a very powerful system that was in part responsible for the reduction, the huge reductions in the epidemic in Tanzania and Kenya and those areas around the Lake Victoria. Okay, why participatory action research? Okay, it arose partly out of response to the dominant practice, dominant practice of health, of health work and health research being defined by an elite grouping. And there is that sense, you know, particularly, and it is a conflict that plays out constantly in South African media, of this conflict between uh, tertiary hospitals with sophisticated care to save children that don't die in need. <coughs> uh, that's why it's often spelled out, with people in dire need, versus development of community systems um, for needs that are less dramatic. Now the reality is that the tertiary system can buy into a whole lot of emotional needs, a lot of emotional issues. You're saving this child on death's door. The community systems and the primary health care probably saves a lot more lives. Getting vaccines out to thousands of kids would cost almost the same as a single major surgical operation around a brain, brain lesion. But the one will one saves one child, the other one will save a lot more. Now it's not to deny that they don't need a balance, but there is this tendency within health to balance around the most, most sophistication of, research, of resources. And to deny this community-based approach. It's also around the difference between preventive and curative health. Now, particularly within research, so that's a health practice, and within research, there's a similar sense of research being defined by an elite groupie. And the constructions of researchers are parachuting in. And I've had that sense very often myself of, we will get funding to do work for a limited number of years in a particular area. And once that research runs out, we have to leave the area. Now, even when, you know, with the work we were doing around uh, risk in Shabins, in Delft, and we weren't doing any intervention, but just the fact that we were showing an interest um, created a, a perception of care. And there was enormous sadness when our field workers had to leave the sites. And there were huge farewells for them. So, and this is trying to use a more, I and mean, it is this note, but it's even worse when you gain in and you do this intervention and then you leave. 
and particularly with medical, with exper with medical trials. It's very often the contact is minimal, a certain amount of medication is provided and then it's gone. Now ethically a lot of studies are now obliged to provide longer term medication, particularly if it's setting into uh, systems where the person needs a lifelong dose. But, it, but that was a lot of the concern is that researchers come in and very often researchers come in when fancy cars, expensive equipment, they collect information and they leave. And often there's not even an intervention as part of it. You know, it's just collecting, literally collecting information on levels of pathology, taking blood samples, etc. I remember one study we were involved in, literally with this OBC study. And it took, caused enormous strife in this community. And it was an issue I'll come back to on negotiation of access. We were doing regional surveys of OBC, orphan and vulnerable children, including HIV prevalence studies. So we would go and interview children and take a blood sample. Now, this caused a complete outcry with, in the community, that we, on the community that we worked in. It was done without any connection to community. It was, access was negotiated by uh, the head of the medical, head of the department, the regional department of head, the head of the regional department of health, covering about 10 towns. He gave permission, so the field workers went in, and I ended up having to do multiple trips to uh, Northwest Province, uh, to Turkstorp area for about ten trips or six, about five or six trips. Day trips, flying in, talking to people, catching a plane back, trying to rescue the situation. And I think that is kind of the opposite end of the extreme of research is just coming, collecting information ostensibly to do something, but you never sh and nothing, very, very little ever came out of that work. So that's the one construction. Then there's the need to empower communities to take control over their own health. So, in the, so that's why PAR is, what PAR is about. Recognition the community has its own knowledge and that it's, and this knowledge is often not accessed or acknowledged. Increase the chance of community taking on findings and the desire to move from deficits to working with strengths. So this is, so in the, the, it was interesting within this one study, we had this one component that was just taking survey data and then the other component was trying to work actively with community members, with community organizations, trying to provide support and assistance, trying to provide networking within them and trying to let them build off one another's strengths. And I was managing that and I was still very young as a researcher, so I was learning my area. Uh, but I think, we, you know, it, for me, on reflection, it balanced out. At that point, it was a lot of confusion. But there's this need to start moving from deficits to working on strengths. And for researchers, particularly, that parachute approach is very seductive. It's much quicker, it's much easier to do, it's less messy, and you're more likely to come out with data that you can publish. And the reality of research in the modern era and research and health is you're not measured by the contribution you make to health systems or to healing. You are measured by the number of publications you have. And it's one of the contradictions that I sit with all the time. I do a lot of work with foreign with international research bodies. And I run around and do the community stuff and deliver the data. Yes, I've got a hell of a lot of publications that I feel I haven't really necessarily earned. But I really battle to find the time to write for myself. I'm constantly running the studies, developing systems. And it is a contradiction that we sit with. Well, you reference <laughs> than other kinds of actual research. And I think, yeah, with some, there's been an effort to build in the space uh, to write. But it's, it does get very hard. 
And it does go back to the seductive notion of building up a set of data that one can just write and building up a set of data that's easy to work with. You don't have the messiness of community. And you know, how does, when you come out of that, if I come, come out of that survey, we had a thousand participants with about 80 or 90 data points for each participant. That's five or six papers. Setting so with these workshops, we have a diffuse set of experiences from conversations with people that are not well organized. You know, we didn't even have a chance to sit down and interview. We probably could have done that, and it might have been a really nice approach if we sat down and interviewed each one of the NGOs and spoken to them. But yeah, so there are those two things. Empowerment, um, that is critical to conceptualization and practice foundations. So what I'd be talking about with empowerment is a social action process <coughs> in which individuals, communities and organizations gain mastery over their lives in the context of changing their social and political environment to improve equity and quality of life. So empowerment is an active process and implies that handing over power and implies giving people who are feeling disempowered that opportunity to gain power. And I think if one goes back to that statistic I spoke about earlier of communities where there's a large differential in, in income as to why somebody even with a larger income if there's a higher differential they'll be, more, they'll be less healthy. It is because of that lack of empowerment and perceived lack of control. Might be crucial to that. I don't know. I think that's something that we need to investigate. But for me, it makes sense. Empowerment is seen as a critical intervening step towards good health. And the more work I do around HIV, and the more work I do around substance use, the more work I do around violence and gender, the more crucial this, this notion of empowerment is. Because in all of those, when you start looking at, well, why don't you use condoms? It's difficult to negotiate with my partner. And that's both men and women. And, that's a, and, and often, you know, both parties in the same relationship might talk about it being difficult to negotiate condoms with that partner. That's, and it's a sense of confidence in self. It's a sense of own worth. It's the same as a... It must have been four years ago now. There was a major announcement in Washington Aid Conference. Which, okay, I think there are more things than that about it, but around the uh, new way to stop the AIDS epidemic with these gels and the COVID side of the gels. That has completely been completely stonewalled because people don't want to use it. And part of it again is women feeling that if they discovered having used it, they'll be rejected, or because a man doesn't like that sensation, or they don't like their sensation in the vagina before giving sex. But they, um, even around health, and that, not around health, around nutrition, empowerment is a crucial issue. Being able to access the right foods, being able to prepare the right foods, having the confidence to do that. So being in control is crucial to both prevention and curative processes. And the gender violence issues and is another area that speaks for itself. And it's for both parties this is crucial. Because I mean, when we're working looking at around um, one of the things that we work found quite early on in the working Shabins is that Men to see the right, if you say bought a woman a drink, she's got to sleep with it. At night. So this became a common transaction. Now, it, but if you start to break that down, now that was, okay, that was a common transaction. So if you start, at first, at, if you break that down at an at a ecological level, at a broader level, the unemployment rate for women is much, much higher, and the salaries, even if women are employed, is much, much lower. 
and access to well, education is fairly similar. In fact, women might have a slightly better education. Uh, it doesn't improve their access to work. So women are already disadvantaged in terms of accessing money, so being able to go into these venues. But then if you went into the venue itself, there was there were different notions of power within that. The men saw that men would get very angry with women who didn't <coughs> comply with the contract. That very obviously favoured men, I and mean, it's very cheap sex to buy a woman a beer and expect for all two or three beers. Women would try, so the woman would get their empowerment or their power by manipulating the system. So they would go, they would drink with several men. Or they'd go as a group to drink with one man and one of them, only one of them would have to sleep with him. Or one spoke about how she had this big male friend who she did with several men and then go and sit with him and that nobody would be prepared to challenge him. But there was another notion also within that of, and it came from actually one of our field workers who spoke about, for women it was a <coughs> area of power just to be able to go into the Shabits. Because particularly in the African context, women were not allowed to drink, just be seen publicly drinking. So it was a whole change in gender notions. So this notions of power, it's very complex, even specifically in that. But what it did mean is that men would feel that they, well, I'm going, going back to the notion of violence, men would feel it is their right to have sex if they bought somebody a drink. And if a woman didn't do it, he would feel emasculate. In order to get that power back, he would beat the woman. And there's a story that we heard, and a horrible one, of a young age girl going into one of the venues and a man buying her drinks, and then she went home, and a man followed her and broke down the door demanding that the young girl come out for sex. In that case, the Shabina, who was no angel, uh, managed to rescue the girl, but still. So, at these, and the women are aware of this, and they play, so they play, that's why she would go and sit with her big friend, so that she would not be beaten. So, it's a notion of power that exists uh, around gender violence. And if there are ways of empowering women, giving them better access to financial resources, giving them some kind of protection around the space. The other notion that led to gender violence in these communities was that, it, and it is an interesting notion that particularly the big venues, women were more at risk. So the legal venues, the Shabins are actually safer. Because the Shabins were local and they were small. So the Shabin owner could if a woman got drunk, she could be walked home and make sure she was safe. But in the big venues, somebody got drunk, they were thrown out. Or at the end of the evening, the woman might have to walk across the community. And she had a choice of walking home by herself and risk being raped, or taking a lift with a man who would expect sex in return. And this was a conflict that a lot of women spoke about. Now, I'm not saying this was every case. I'm sure there were some Samaritans who would make sure that they got home or they come in groups and be able to find a way. <clears throat> but if this is a regular risk that you face, then there's an issue around empowerment and how the empowerment of women would have been enormously protected. So, <clears throat> power exists in terms of resources, funding, uh, background to research, knowledge, social constructs, identities. So we've spoken about the resources, uh, funding, and this is often a disempowerment of communities in relation to the researchers. The researchers come in with uh, funding, they come in with the research knowledge. So when you negotiate in your research, this has to be taken into account. And you have to look at, well, okay, how do we 
I'm sure provide um, how do we empower communities not just around income but around knowledge and the capacity to, to work in the research. There's social constructs coming from the university and it's, it's something that's very easy to trade on is you know everything and the community knows nothing so they've got to listen to you. Identities, there's racial identity and a whole lot of other identities of power and education. Now, I went out of my way to get field workers who were, would be able to identify and would be able to fit into the um, Shabins, where, where we structured that research was we had two teams of three, three, one team working in dominantly colored Shabins and the other work black researchers working in uh, African Shabins. And, yeah, they were, I've got people who are familiar with Shabins who spent time in Shabins on, on a personal level. But as soon as I went in, and they were obviously identifiable because they were not allowed to drink while they were at work. And they would spend, where they worked, sorry, is they would spend a week observing in a Shabin, a week doing cross-sectional surveys. And then the woman would come in to be interviewed on a, either qualitatively or on a, a CASI survey format. And we went back to each Shabin four times in a cycle of once every three months or once every four months. So the, they were very familiar to, so the community knew who the, knew the, and the Shabin, uh, Shabin people in the Shabin knew them. Even though they came from fairly common, similar background, because they were Stonebosch researchers, and because they were earning no salary, they were immediately seen as different and above. Um, access to power and resources reflects existing political economies and it's often not due to efficiency or need of, or merit. She's supposed to be here. She's next door. She's supposed to be here. Is her name on the register? Yeah, no, she was here and then somebody from Health Economics asked her to go there. So. She's up paid for you and then it specifically said all the interns must attend. Okay, well... They need to write the exam. She needs to be in this class. Okay. So, this is a funding issue. But if it's true, PA or community mm -hmm. about protocol with community. But it's not particularly realistic. I'm just speaking from mm -hmm. my perspective as a young researcher, a young foreign researcher, who have the community that I'm developing, will be working with, will be predominantly a coloured African which I speak Irish, English, French, which is of absolutely no use. And nobody really wants to talk to me that much. I'm pretty comfortable because I'm purely a European. But we have already developed this protocol, got funding, and you can't really change it too much. And I just kind of struggle to wonder whether or not we can get true PA or because this is how research is set up now. Now, when you, you, you kind of go in a bi-ranking context, so our um, communities in Jana and in Kenya and Kenry, they've done a lot of work. They've done a lot of work with the community, uh, but that has taken a lot of time to build up. You know, it took them 10, 20 years of the Wellcome Trust really dedicating themselves to, and now actually, I think 5% of all grants Wellcome Trust go to community based work. But I'm just wondering how can you achieve true PA or considering how funding the situation is It is a thing, and I will come back to you just now about levels of participatory work, and I think you move towards that. And, yeah, and it would be, so yes, the, in the first stage you do sometimes have, you can't just go in cold and say, well, we want to raise the money, can you say, well, why should we participate? Um, welcome back. <laughs> so, um, Yeah, let me come back to your question and then just see if we've answered it, yeah. Okay, I think so, I think the note, the other construction is that uh, when I spoke about the emphasis on tertiary care and some of the current emphases in health, 
those aren't necessarily due to efficiencies, aren't due to you know, what would say the most lies. That is due to political economies that exist. There's this huge conflict around uh, national health insurance in South Africa. And a huge fear amongst and obviously, and it's a very real fear around the richer communities that their medical aid will be undermined by this. And it's true, they probably will be. But the reality is that that will produce a more secure health system for the country as a whole. So, and it goes down to a uh, liberal notion they hide the truth behind distribution. And when there's cuts and funding to tertiary institutions, and I buy into it all the time, there's the notions of, well, these children who are on emergency life support will, might die if we cut this off. But the reality is, as I said earlier, that the transferring the funding may save a lot more children. And the one, um, and even constructions of evidence-based, work. And one of the concerns I have around HIV at the moment is so much of the money has moved out from preventative work to this um, treat, treatment of prevention. Now treatment of prevention is a really good notion in a, in a wealthy country with a smelly, fairly small epidemic. In a country like South Africa you cannot put five million people on ARVs. Actually, what's it would be? We've got 70 million at the moment, 12.5%. That's nearly nine million people, not people on ARVs. It just is, we, and currently have about half a million on ARVs, and that's really, really stretching the, the health budget. If we put everybody who's HIV positive on ARVs, it's just not going to work. And then there's the, all the problems of um, follow-up, the health systems that have to, you know, that's just the drugs would be. There's the problem of uh, actual follow-up, there's the problem of adherence. We won't have adherence levels. And I was just looking at, this is not even adherence, this is just maintenance and care, range from about 50 to 70 percent in clinics around Cape Town. Uh, which means you start developing <coughs> drug-resistant processes, drug-resistant um, disease profiles, or drug-resistant HIV. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an evidence-based system, but it's not a reality-based system. And we need to go back to looking at other forms of prevention. But if, if you look at research and funding for research, particularly looking at I don't know Wellcome Trust, but um, you know the NIH and the European sources, European a little bit better, but particularly in our National Institute of Health in the US, which is probably still the biggest funder of research internationally. It's very hard to get stuff outside of um, treatment as prevention. And you know, collaborators I'd work with who strong community based supporters would would were talking about it's not even worth putting the funding proposals in. I think under Obama it has now improved slightly, but, you know. So one's got to be careful of, of all of the notions that we come to accept, and even notions like evidence-based can be difficult. And the prevention stuff that we've been doing, a lot of it has been based from people coming in with high ideals and morals saying this is what you should do. And it's not really reflecting what the issues are on the ground. That's also because it's really populated those groups. Because I was in China and Germany, and they were mm. different guidance. And in that room, it was all predominantly mm. Western people. Even though it's not exactly Western disease, there was one or two people who were affiliated from the African continent. And it's really that you can do the affiliation, one with Kakusa and then one in Toronto. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it is, an, you know, the whole ABC was, was a huge problem. 
and it, the, it worked to some degree in Kenya and Tanzania and they were able to, through a massive mobilization of community, they were able to reduce the epidemic quite significantly. He's now seen it been rising again, but I'm not sure of the latest statistics. But then, so what I'm saying is the prevention stuff that was done was also done from this. Very often, it wasn't even, it wasn't, certainly wasn't evident based, but it was done from an elitist perspective. And just on the WHO stuff, I don't know if you've read the book, and unfortunately I don't know where my copy is anymore. Uh, Wisdom of Whores. It's a lovely book to read. Uh, it's written by somebody from WHO who was reflecting on what she'd learned from the street workers in sex workers in Philippines and the uh, Far East. And uh, basically completely conflicted with whatever was being coming out of the major health organizations. And, uh, and HIV AIDS, it has generated a huge level of groundswell of participation. And that has been core to the ending of the epidemic in the US and in Europe, and reducing it. But it, we need a different approach in Africa. And a different approach is needed in the East. And so, and that hasn't been allowed. There's the, a lot of the approaches that try to stick with that. And so it's interesting, I'm starting to see now more calls for saying, okay, what we've been doing was wrong, we need to find a new way in. And the Shabin study that we did was basically saying, not a single study, tr intervention attempt, trying to work with people who drink to reduce their risk for HIV has worked. So we're going back to basics. So I'm, and we've done that. I've got some ideas, but we still need to get something off the ground, and I'm trying to write proposals on that, but trying to uh, submit multiple proposals that are too much funding at the moment. So, yeah, and I think there are the constructs of morality and normality that guide how people intervene. And there are also some of the evidence, even, some, even the evidence-based notions can be problematic. And it gets down to research, and people, I don't know if you are familiar, I hear it all the time, history is written by the people who won the battles. So research is controlled by the people in power. So those who they generate the subject matter for research, they control who will lead the research, they direct where the research will be done, define the nature of the interventions that will be tested. And it active and the systems actively preclude challenges to that, often argued on the basis of science. So if I go back to the, what I was talking about with um, treatment and prevention. If you try and take stuff in, new challenges in, there's active argument against it, saying that there's no evidence we need to stick with where the evidence lies, and the evidence is treatment and prevention. I've just finished uh, writing a proposal submitted on Friday with a group where we've been trying to get funding to do work around women who've experienced violence and trauma. Because there's such strong evidence that women who've experienced violence, sexual violence, particularly in childhood sexual abuse, are massively high at risk. The difference in terms of uh, HIV prevalence, the difference in terms of risk behavior if you picked up is huge. And tied in with that, you know, there's a multiplying effect of them being more likely to, those women be more likely to be using substances at high level, more likely to get into um, abusive relationships, all of which then replicate the trauma. But it's been really, really hard, and we've been, there's kind of a saying we recognize is important, but we need to do this. So we've eventually now tied it to treatment as prevention. Knowing amongst ourselves that there's no way that South Africa will ever be able to introduce 
full coverage of ARVs for every person that's affected and infected. But at least trying to build adherence amongst HIV positive women who experience trauma and trying to the idea is to set a trauma informed care. So to work with clinic staff uh, to get them to recognize the particular additional levels of care that women have experienced trauma need. And the intervention, the study is directed around women who are on ARVs to keep them adherent, but hopefully the implications will go a lot further. We'll have to see if we do actually get the funding. But yeah. So and that's not participatory work by any it is actually. It's participatory within the health services which is an aspect of it's not community-based, it's health service community participatory work. But, very often, but as I'm saying, the subject matter, and it came out very clearly with the PEP forward. That was a huge amount of money that changed the face of HIV intervention. And it was extremely positive. But there were certain ludicrous declarations. It couldn't be used and it couldn't apply for sex workers. It could not be, no conversations around abortion or anything like that could be part of it. And there are even restrictions on condom distribution. Certain restrictions. So, and PEPFAR, which, but I'm particularly going to talk, uh, it just created a, it provided a whole lot of money but shackled the hands of so many of the people working in it. It directs them where the research will be done. And there's a lot of conflict currently within the US about whether NIH money should be used outside the US. A lot, most EU funding is for use in the EU. So it's, and those are the two, probably the two biggest sources of funding nationally. You know, it's hard to argue, in some respects it's hard to argue. People will want to use money inside their own country. But the reality is the majority of the health problems exist in Africa and Asia. The construction of power, of this power can lead to internalized sense of depression, of oppression, or sense of deserving less. Now the way this works out is that those who are HIV positive get told that they are HIV positive because of their own behavior. So they are to be blamed. So not only should they be apologizing, they should be grateful for any assistance that they get. And if we look at the early HIV interventions internationally, in South Africa did have some very good examples, the victims were blamed in most cases. And there were and in their minds did a lot of HIV education at the time. And I watched one of the videos and they contrasted the good migrant worker who stayed faithful to his wife and just worked hard and sent all his money back with a terrible migrant worker who would go out and have drinks and sleep with women. And very clearly, and in the end of it, you'd see the good worker going back with the sewing machine and a sack of food to his wife and children, all very happy to see him, and the bad migrant migrant worker being lowered into a grave. So, yeah, it's this construction of blame that's very much part of it. And it applies particularly for women. Technical language, so it's a power, construction of power relationship and what uh, Kiara was talking about, of having to get around some of those relationships of power. Technical language can disempower communities as, control, as can control over resources. So researchers have to constantly look at how they represent themselves and act in terms of power relations. And this is a, this is a constant task. A constant effort that has to be done by researchers. And it's 
And I balked at it sometimes, and for years with PED, I was completely put off participatory work, because I worked on one study that was participatory, and put a lot of effort into organizing our feedback in the community. And I got into the community to do the feedback, and three people arrived. And we provi uh, provided refreshments, which you'll see later is crucial for community work. We organized another one and put even more effort into the distribution. About seven people arrived. Yeah, we were catering 400. So, yeah, it's... And I'm not sure what we did wrong. But, yeah, it's... A, it is... Sorry, this is... Well, partly directed you. It's partly a process of developing that relationship and developing the connection. But researchers have to constantly be putting themselves out there. I spoke about my PhD research at working through the UDF, etc. UDF and civics. It took me eight months to negotiate access into the area. And that was driving out to Paul and Sarenbosch, you know, phoning... I remember the one thing I was... I must have phoned the head of the civic and the UDF, the two friends. I must have phoned them about 20 times, tried to set up meetings, Eventually, I think I wore them down. Uh, we had a meeting in their house. And the meeting was such an anticlimax after all of that before. Because we sat and spoke for about 15 minutes. And then they said, um, we have to move outside. Days of our lives are coming on and the whole family watches. So you saw the entire family, about 10 people coming in, from the granny to the three-year-old, coming in to watch Days of Our Lives. And we went outside and we concluded agreements and they gave formal access. Now, obviously, it was a process of talking to so many people and being tested and all of that. And you will be tested multiple times. But that's the kind of if they constantly have to be going into. And when you've got a fact that then I was single and it was a bit easier. Now I've got a daughter and it's a bit harder. And I've got to be at home sometimes. And she's with in my house. I've got to be at home. I can't go off to meetings. Uh, you've got a lot of stuff has to happen after hours. A lot of stuff has to... There's a lot of additional time has to be put in. And this is something the researcher has to adapt to. You have to explain things multiple times. You have to find new ways to explain things. The lovely story of a friend of mine who was working in the Limpopo area. Not, not Limpopo, Pumalanda, sorry. I'll, I'll say in purple, it has more poetic resonance. <laughs> um, and they're desperately trying to explain distribution. You know, so many people were this, so many people had, so many people had TB, so many people had HIV, so many people were healthy. I can't remember what the distribution system was. And they had these big pie diagrams on the walls, and people would look here, they could not understand it, could not come to terms with it. So eventually they went to the bakery and bought three cakes. And they cut them up according to the splits. And suddenly just having that material sense in front of them makes sense. People suddenly started reflecting and understanding. And that got to eat the cakes once I understood, so there's probably a lot more motivation to get that understanding. So it's, it does put a lot of additional work. Um, yeah, you spoke about levels of empowerment here, and this is one of the things I want to just look at. If you look here, oh no, sorry, this is levels of empowerment, sorry. There's individual, there's organizational, neighborhood and community, all of these have to, so you've got to look at all of those aspects when you're looking at empowerment. Dimensions of empowerment is participate, so, one level the community has to be able to work together. The organizations that are actively part of that community have to be able to interact and connect and have to have that sense of own sense of power. And then there's the individuals, the people themselves have to feel that they've got some power to be able to make a difference. I'm just realizing I've been talking more than I thought. Okay. 
These are mentions of empowerment. There's participation, being able to participate. There's having control. And then there's critical awareness. Now these, that partly is a graduation. So participation is, is in some respects the easiest. Having a feeling for community members to have a feeling of control and being able to actually influence decisions is another level. And then developing critical awareness to be able to critique and modify and work around it requires a higher level. And part of my background training was um, working as an anti-apartheid activist in the 80s. And I worked with unions and I worked with uh, civic structures. And for me what was fascinating was just particularly working with the civic structures. It was just the different levels and the same, and different levels and different understandings of power. Working within those working within those groupings, and um, uh, I'm going to come back to that at some point. But in particularly there, just uh, what was going to say is the relevance of core documentation. So the Freedom Charter became a position, an item of core power that people could reflect and use as we might use a different kind of academic text. The Freedom Charter is used as a crucial text to argue, and I did a lot of work around it, work around housing and access to housing, and that was used, and you know, working with this grouping, I wish I'd kept the paperwork, developed a specific charter around access to housing and housing, what should, what should be there around housing for people. What empowerment embodies is <coughs> social change processes and transforming conditions. So what is the change that is required and how do you actually set about and develop those structures that will facilitate that transformation? Empowerment establishes an intermediate step of in community enhancement to allow for improved health and community development. So empowerment is not the end goal, but empowerment is that crucial step that allows for that to happen. It gives, kind of puts the energy into the system. So parts of the step include for the community increased sense of control, increased sense of own power and control, increased social networking and increased community leadership. And that social networking, just to reflect on that briefly, is crucial. And if one looks back at apartheid and history, one of the crucial aspects of apartheid was breaking, and in particular forced removal, was breaking down social networking and the destruction of that. Take that District 6 was a powerful community that was actively resistant to the state. So what the state did was they forcibly removed that, but they didn't move the community in one block. They split that community up over about 20, 10 to 15 different suburbs. And I was talking to people who were moved in that era. And what ended up is that people were sitting in their houses terrified to go outside. So the only people that went outside were young guys who were very angry. And what did that lead to? It led to the development of the gangs. So the young Americans, the junky funky kids, all the major criminal gangs that dominate the Cape Flats arose out of that system. But it broke entire area, area of resistance. So, and what it also, and other, so, and so the part that kind of gives the antithesis of community development. Because the other thing that there was done was the constant arrest and torture of community leadership. And what you do, if, if some if leadership does develop, if you take it out, and then if you torture the community leadership, that person returns broken, it, it, it constantly is breaking down that level. 
No, okay, so going back, so that is, those are the areas that are important, is this building of control, building of networking, building of community leadership. Now this is of course hard. And hard at the personal level, now it's hard for researchers to hand over power. You've got money, you've got to account for it. Uh, and different funding agencies have very strict accountability, accountability procedures. So you can't hand over a blank check. And the study I was involved in recently that was intended as community based. And one of the crucial, it's got a whole lot of people volunteering, but they thought that they were going to get handouts as a result of this. So you also do face the sense of entitled, uh, face the problem of potential feelings of entitlement. Okay, so but power is hard to hand over, resources are hard to hand over, both personally and the researchers will want to keep our salaries intact. And uh, yeah, and power is hard to hand over, power of the decision making, how the research will be done. We are expected to maintain scientific procedures. Now what happens if there's a challenge to that and different approaches are demanded? How do we negotiate that? And there's a far greater acceptance now of qualitative procedures or alternative methods. But it is still within the literature, if you can hand over an experimental trial, you're far more likely to be published than if you have a community initiated study that works on um, photographs taken or people talking amongst themselves in a workshop in format. Trust for both communities and researchers is hard. Communities have, and, and Cape Town is kind of a really bad example of a research, of a good research community because everybody in Europe and the US wants to come and do research in Cape Town. It's beautiful, it's got nice beaches, it's got good restaurants, it's yeah, it was rated as one of the top ten foodie rest camp cities in the world. It has wine farms, beaches, etc. But what that means is that a lot of research has been done, and a lot of communities are sated with research. And if, I was just recently talking to people in the winelands, and they have researchers up to here, they have researchers up to here, because they've just got too many studies, more, far more studies than they can handle. The wine is beautiful. So, and it is just a case, and it's, a lot of the researchers come and leave. In the Department of Health, I've worked really hard to develop relationships there. And I give feedback whenever I do studies, but so many people have come in and just collect the data and then say goodbye and never give anything back. Well, they might send a copy of the paper. But most often the Department of Health will find the paper two years later in, on a literature search. So there are these problems with research being done. And it's a, the, there is a trust issue with communities already. Frustration and their anger can arise at any point in time. And they are the, are the best of interest. I've doing community feedback in, uh, in Delft once. And I got a hugely angry response from the community policing forum because one of the groups I critiqued was the police. With the police who applied racist approaches and the way they were attacking Shabins. And there are clearly groups of police that were um, demanding bribes. Otherwise they would close Shabins. And so, and when you get to the situation of methamphetamine use, it's uh, considerably worse. But you have to constantly work on maintaining communication and establishing respectful relationships. Participation. <coughs> what does participation mean? Um, and what is meaningful participation? We have to reduce, our, to reduce dependency on the health service and put people in control of their own health. Participation is essential. And by participation, And implicit within the statement, guys, yeah, a different approach to health care, moving from curative to preventive. And the construction, the popular, the popular methodological, 
mystical construction of health care, of health and health services, is of curative services. Now you come in sick and you get, you get medical medicine and you leave well. Now the majority of health problems that most of our communities face aren't of that nature. You know, even TB and HIV, it's a long period of treatment and even when you're feeling well, it doesn't mean you can stop taking the medication. But you start dealing with all the other larger lifestyle diseases, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, all of those. Those are not issues, those are issues of prevention and issues of constant maintenance of diet. So there's a need to move to a different system. And the health sector has been stuck in this curative process for way too long. And it's, it's kind of the system that maintains the godlike status of the doctors because you can rescue a person from the point of death and bring them back to health. And it's particularly within some of the infectious disease and surgical areas. And you can see it even within this faculty that the resources provided to community health are a fraction of what is provided to surgery or medicine, internal medicine. Participation also means that considers people as human and independent. There's this tendency to see, to put people into boxes and that each has specified have a specified role. And this can be difficult both for community members and for academic researchers. And especially in health. In health, everything is assigned a system. And even within the health professions, you get your uh, specialists, then your doctors, and then you get the nurses and other allied health professionals. And you're expected to, and respect is, is expected to be shown up the order of hierarchy. So, yeah. Okay, researchers are facing a backlash. There's a helicopter research, people going in. A helicopter implies people going in, doing research, and then disappearing. So literally dropping from a helicopter, collecting their data, and then they lift it and disappearing. And the community not seeing any benefit or anything coming from that. And now with incentives, communities do see some benefit coming back. But there's a lot of argument against that. Researchers are only taking leave. Unethical approach has been used. And um, you saw that in the worst examples like Tuskegee and then uh, people know Tuskegee study. No, anybody not know it? Uh, Tuskegee study was a study done in the US where men who contracted syphilis were a cohort of about a thousand or more uh, people who contracted it were put on a list and actively refused treatment. They were not allowed to get treatment for it because they wanted to look at the life cycle of syphilis in a controlled group. And their names went around the community so that anywhere they went, they were refused treatment. <coughs> and a lot of people died of a preventable condition. <coughs> and then this was reinforced more recently in a study done in South America where they were working with the prison population. They looked again at syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases and blocked treatment. But there weren't enough people with the disease. So they gave a day, a special day for the, sex, for the prisoners and sent in sex workers who were all infected to infect the prisoners. And then continue to follow the disease. So, and what is interesting of that is colonizing research process is that because it was now ethically barred in the US, uh, the research was um, exported to another site. The centralized ownership of research, that its research is controlled. I mean, one of the problems of, of the review system is that those who 
do a successful research now more about how to write a successful proposal and are more likely to be recognized by the reviewers, are more likely to be funded. Now some systems have tried to encourage new researchers to come in, but it is very hard as a new researcher to get funded. The ladder of participation. Okay, this is just a conceptual framework looking at levels of community involvement in research. And it outlines a range of strategies of working, or organized by degree of community involvement or the state role. Also depends on progression <coughs> as you enter and build relationships. So this is actually focused more on the Department of Health, but I think it applies very nicely for research. Um, Cara, this is, gives you some idea in response to your issue. So on the one hand, you have the researcher leads. The Department of Health person comes in, directs, leads, directs community to act. The next level is inform and educate. So you provide education to the community. So it's not just a case of you going and collecting data and leaving. You'll at least provide some education on health issues as part of it. To some level of it. There's, all, there's a limited input and consultation. Then there's comprehensive consultation and influence. There are community members for ongoing support and substantial, uh, more substantial input. And the standard community advisory board, which a lot of researchers do feel like, do put in, would kind of fall between those two. In bridging community members play roles, become institutionalized and agents in creating a pathway for formal information sharing and feedback. Now you're starting to see more active work coming in. Empower sharing community members and part of health define and solve problems together. And community leads, community members initiate and direct the effort. So, in an ideal participatory work, you'd be working here. Now, research doesn't have to be here. There's some studies that have to be further out. Particularly, you know, if you're working with large national studies, large uh, randomized controlled trials. But, it's, as Kara pointed out, it's very hard to start here. There's a lot of trust and relationships that need to be developed. So, one way of going is to start here. So you'll start with developing a board. And we submitted a proposal recently around uh, trying to work in Delft on the issues of diarrhea and gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal disease illness. And we would start there, but then the idea would be to gradually over time move to there, move to there, then. Now, obviously, within any limited funding study, you are limited in time. So this would be a five-year program. So we might, by the end, be reaching this kind of point. My hope is that by the end of that study, we'd have established a group that would exist at this level that could then be host further applications. And I'm hoping now to put in another study together with uh, the NIH, also with, um, also with, uh, to do work in Delft around methamphetamine use and to work on a participatory basis with community organizations. And also approaching uh, one of the local funders to start doing something with Shabina on it working on a participatory basis to try and get education on fetal alcohol syndrome into the um, clinics, into the shabins, because we're finding very high levels of uh, fast in, all, in the community. <laughs> but this gives you an indication of the distribution. <coughs> and CBPR literally is probably it depends who you talk to, would come from there to there. Processes is important. The other thing with 
quality with CVPR is that process, the process by which you work is as important as the results. So both have a key focus. So, and this goes back to this notion of empowerment in education. So it's not just getting the results of the study out. It's not just the act. But through the process you develop empowerment, you develop education. And coming out of that is action. So it's not just so, you know, process is as important within CVPR as the results. And it's not just methods to comply with stated, not just a methodology to comply with your stated protocol and ethics. The implied within a participatory approach is a constantly evolving methodology. And that is also one of the diffi real difficulties of funding proposals, is you expect it to go in with a tight methodology. Um, but within a CVPR approach, this methodology needs to evolve. So what often happens is that you might fund a little bit for community consultation, and that becomes trying desperately to scratch together resources to build a gradually burgeoning collection of work on community consultation. Uh, it has to be constantly responsive to where community needs are. So, for example, if we go in with diarrhea, and we know diarrhea is a major issue, but if the people there say, well, actually the main problem is substance abuse or gender violence, how do we actually respond to it? Because our hands are somewhat tied by our funding, but we're also tied on the other side by what the community wants. You can get a, well, some way out of it by saying, well, okay, we, if we work together on this, we'll apply for funding to do work on gender violence and substance abuse. So it's a constant trade for both researchers and the communities. And ultimately, it's not just research control towards publications only. And you have to leave something behind at the end of the research. Okay, taking sides. Uh, participatory research is not a neutral activity. And, um, okay. You mind we're going to go a little bit beyond half past, so people are still alive and awake. Okay. Participatory research is not neutral. And values, your values as a researcher are a core component. And as you can see, it's implied, and okay, I'm taking a particularly political approach to participatory. I should have warned you about that in advance. Um, you need to work towards an emancipatory focus. You need towards this empowerment. You need to work towards liberating people from whatever's held them back in the past. So you aim at a lot of research, health research, has a feeling very often of disempowering. Blaming people for their infection, blaming people for their disease. Um, or putting all the curative process in a particular clinic and saying, look, you've got to get there to be healed. When looking at like, participatory research, is, does that not mean room for like, a bias because it's not neutral? So kind of taking someone's side and will that impact on, on, how can I say, your results at the end of the day? Okay, so just coming to this. <laughs> okay. Subjectivity is a part of participatory research. That's clear. But it does not mean a bias. And one of the, my opening slide in the qualitative course has, I think, the second point I make, that objectivity is a myth. It's a bit like, or at best, a useful metaphor much like Father Christmas and the Easter Bunny. <laughs> now, Father Christmas is a mythical figure that's used to make children behave towards, before, as you get closer to Christmas, otherwise he won't visit, and he's monitoring everybody. And I'm sure you've seen multiple comic strips of these terrified kids trying to hide from Father Christmas when they put slugs in their father's shoes. 
Moses or then whatever. So yeah, so objectivity. So what I'm saying with that is that objectivity is used very often by research to claim that values have an influence. But if you start to unpack that, values are clearly influenced. The decisions around the research, how it's been done, etc. Yes, systems do try to reduce external influence. Now, what you're trying to do with, and this is a take from qualitative research, is you re recognize where you are taking your subjectivity. You recognize where you are taking sides. And you make that explicit. Now, that does two things. One, it gives a reader a clear understanding of the basis on which you're working. So they can read the paper or the report with that in mind. And two, by recognizing your subjectivity, you take it into control in your analysis. If you pretend you're not subjective, you cannot control for it. And that subjectivity appears. That subjectivity is there anyway. We're human beings. We're not automatic. We're not robots. We make decisions based on what we believe. So what you strive for instead of objectivity is accuracy in reporting and understanding. But we do side with the disadvantaged in the work. You side with the community members. Now, obviously, if the community members demand a tertiary hospital, and you can't support that. You have to add reality to it. You have to add components of that to it. And the interpretation we give is from the side that's been lacking in power, in traditional power. So you work from what their needs are. But remember when you're reporting, you're saying this, the community's needs are this and this, to be able to address this and this. So it is a reasoned argument, and is a clear analysis of why this is there. So yes, you are biased, but it's accurate, and it's clear, and it's, your process is there. <coughs> And if one looks at, I would argue, you know, going back to um, you know, treatment as prevention, there's a clear bias there towards medical treatment as the system, towards a high capital orientated approach to health, towards a profit margins. All of those are implicit in that. Because even with a redu huge reduction in drug prices, there are huge profits being made from the system. And if one looks at the uh, emphasis in terms of expenditure on drugs, and it is one of something that has recently been reported on, none of the drug companies are interested in working on a new antibiotic because there's no profit to be made from it. It cures people. And a part of me wonders if that's why there's been so little advance <coughs> on vaccines and treatment and cure for AIDS. There have been huge advances, but the major advances have been around maintaining people in, uh, through ARVs. So that's part of my cynical like side. So I mean, I'm not saying that <laughs> it hasn't been work done, but where the emphasis of resources has gone in. So knowledge is not value-free, but always serves the interest of one group or another. Positivistic statements pretend to be value-free, but often hide other interests. So as I've just been talking about, with what is the potential around a drug-orientated drug treatment? So CBPR recognizes and tries to refocus on community values. And we'll look at this more in with Fira and, working in the, and that work in the next lecture. So the key questions that need to be understood, what is the philosophy of this approach? What is community-based and participatory research? What is actually community? And these are all things we'll address in the later. What is action research approach? How do we involve communities? And how do we learn and develop? 
and that's both communities and ourselves. And we're going to try and deal with all of those issues as we go through. CBPR is, become, is an increasingly important focus for health research. And there's a lot of, it's been fought out on a lot of battlegrounds around funders and universities around the world as to whether there should be allowed additional focus and how important it is this. And it's been fought out on this campus. You know, community health is constantly looking for additional resources and funding and there's battles against other departments. And particularly in a context of funds being cut every year to the faculty. It does fight an uphill battle. Um, but it's becoming more and more required as the nature of health threats change. There's more lifestyle disease, there's more clarity on impact of income and resource disparities in health. People in communities wanting greater control over their health. And we've seen this with the With the rise in revolutionary activities, you saw it, people are demanding greater control. The whole Arab Spring was its spring, was about people wanting control. In many cases that has spun out of control. But we're starting to see that uh, the whole Occupy movement, even within Europe, is about communities wanting to take back control. And it's seen as increasing commitments to and it's seen in com increasing commitment to community-based work locally and internationally and with people at a community level rising up. Importantly, CBPR is research and it is science. And it is science if we make it science. Going in purely as an activist and fighting for rights doesn't, doesn't make it science. We need to work constantly at it. And making our methodologies clear and working on an organized, systematic, scientific basis. But there are many who are degraded and are threatened by the, what this approach raises. It is advancing as a methodology and through increasing levels of publications and courses such, like that, such as this, it will grow further. This reflects also a requirement on those using the methodology to make sure that accurate and strong methodologies there's a growth in street science, and I'll send to you more on that later. Conclusion, CBPR is, is an orientation to research. It changes the role of the researcher and the research. It is not a method or set of methods, although there have been a lot of methodologies developed purely for use in CBPR, orientated on CBPR. It uses a broad range of approaches. As I said, you know, survey work, qualitative work, even randomized controlled trials can be part of community-based work. Goal is to influence change in community health, systems, programs, policies, and across all ecological levels. And to facilitate a transforma transformative change in the participants. Okay, thank you.